poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG is one of the premier live and online poker tournament players in the world with over 9.3 million in live MTT caches, Shannon Shore. It makes sense that Shannon would be special guest number 200 because his first CPG appearance is still to this day one of the top three most listened to episodes in CPG history. If you haven't yet checked that one out, I highly suggest hitting the back catalog directly after today's show. And in my experience with Shannon, he's a model of thoughtfulness, consistency, humility, and maybe the most important attribute of professional poker players, determination. He's been on this ride for almost two decades with no signs of slowing down anytime soon. In today's show with the great Shannon Shore, we're going to dive deep into how painful the life of a traveling poker player can be, Shannon's experience being a proud new papa, how easy it is to get frustrated when you're on the grind, even when things are seemingly going well, and much, much more. So now, without any further ado, I bring to you one of the very best poker players in the world, the one and only Shannon Shore. Mr. Shore, uh, I'll wait until you, you take your drink of water, coffee. What are we drinking today? Got a matcha latte. There you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how you been? How you been since the, the first round, man? Uh, things are great. I uh, had, a, had a kid about four weeks ago, my first kid. It's been amazing. A uh, baby girl named Nora. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. Poker's been... Uh, had a nice score the other day. That was great after what was a wrecked World Series of Poker. So <laughs> came at a good time. And I was, I was going to say, play. yeah, I was going to say, you, you've had quite the year. I saw you're like number 11 in card player POY. Um, you've had a million in caches. H- how's your year been? I guess including the World Series. We can't really just take the wins and <laughs> not look at the losses. Exactly. Yeah, I always try to represent uh, my poker experience as like authentically as possible you know you see so much like misleading from people about how how it's actually going you only see the win Mm -hmm. people always want to throw people always want to post like the uh how much is up top or how much they won but like no one ever talks about swaps or any or being backed or anything like that Mm -hmm. i'm not backed i play on my own dime but i do swap so you know i have big scores like some money comes out but hopefully i get some back swaps as well and swaps, uh, but, what's the value of swapping? I, I mean, from your perspective, I would assume variance reduction. Yeah, that's uh, the on, only real reason I do it. Also, I think, uh, well, I, I choose my swaps pretty carefully. Uh, and But I also like the uh, sort of community uh, feeling that you get because poker's obviously such a, like a lonely endeavor. Um, yeah, it can so, be. Yeah. So I, yeah, I like to, uh, you know, it's nice to have some swaps and be able to, have people talk hands with people who have like a sort of a rooting interest in how you do. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, just like you said, fellowship, being involved together, having the sweat with each other. I think all that stuff, it's just fun. It's just like good for the soul. Totally. Uh, yeah. So it's been a pretty good year. I've had, uh, I've won three tournaments. I had a third and in, in this win, uh, tournament. To, to close off the year after, like I said, what was a really brutal World Series, <laughs> I was starting to get pretty frustrated with the game. But uh, so many times throughout my 15-year career, I've gone on these like long losing stretches just playing live tournaments. So it's uh, pretty much when you're playing tournaments for a living, you better be mentally tough and better be prepared for like whatever the game throws at you because it can be very vicious at times. Yeah, l- like I said, <clears throat> you know, you're like. 11th on card player 
have over a million in caches and like we're getting extremely frustrated <laughs> nearing the <laughs> end of the WSOP, which was only, you know, a couple of months ago, right? Yeah, even less, I guess, one month ago. One month ago. Um, yeah, it's, I, I find that my, despite all this time, all the like work I put in, I still find that my confidence like swings wildly when I'm, <laughs> you know, it, you're only, one of, I remember one of my friends saying you're only ever like one or two weeks away from convincing yourself you suck at poker. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I love everything about poker often. I hate it often, but I still like, I'll, it'll always be a part of my life. It's, it's moments like the one I just experienced being deep in this tournament. It's just, there's nothing like it. And how, how do you improve that resilience or how do you um, confront those sort of self doubt doubting questions in your mind of like, did I just lose it? Like, did I just like, have I been just been getting lucky these last five years? Um, did I ever have it? Will it ever come back? Like, am I just ru going to ruin my family's life if I keep playing <laughs> poker every day? You know, just all of these thoughts that, uh, at least I've thought to myself a billion times. Yeah, that's, that's the hard part. It's definitely a theme in my, I don't know whether I guess different people have like a different relationship with like how hard they are on themselves and, and stuff like that. But I throughout like different sports that I played, I always basically thought that I like it, maybe it was a dr way to drive me. I just always thought like I wasn't like one of the best. So I just like kept going and going and always putting in the work and same same with poker. Um, but as far as like when when poker gets tough, I really think it's important to do like some hard things. Um, or probably probably the same for anything. Whenever any aspect of your life isn't going well, I think it's important to like reach into your tool bag and do like some cold showers or meditation or you know workouts, reading as opposed to just being in front of screens. Um, I think those are great for like doing hard things when when you don't want to. Like that has uh, for me proven to like pull me out of like some dark times in my life for sure. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you find the willpower to do those hard things when you least want to do them? So yeah, it can be quite hard to, to find the willpower. Eventually, I think I get to a point where I just feel like such a shell of myself where I'm just going through the motions where I'm like, all right, Shannon, you got to like tomorrow's the morning where you're getting up and taking a cold shower. You're going to go right outside and meditate, go through your yoga routine. You're not I'll, I might do something like move my phone upstairs so there's no possibility that I can, you know, look at my phone first thing. And yeah, just, just trying to, uh, you know, build willpower like step by step by, I think like getting started <clears throat> on anything often for me will lead to just me doing more, you know, things that are good for myself. Yeah, it's so easy to spiral downward and very difficult to stop that spiral. Um, and like, there's an expression, uh, maybe it's a tweet. I don't know. There's a quote, somebody said it somewhere and it resonated with me that like, oftentimes the thing that you least want to do is the thing you most need to do. Uh, and, and that just holds true for me. Um, in most facets of life is like, I don't want to do this thing. You dread it. Uh, and then you do the thing and you start sort of immediately gaining the rewards, whether it's just like improved cognition, upgraded energy. Um, you know, you haven't gone on the treadmill, you haven't gone on a walk, you haven't exerted yourself physically. Well, you get a lot of rewards when you do it the first time, way more than when you do it like the hundredth day in a row. You, it's like this immediate gratification. So yeah, for the listener, for sure. The thing that you least want to do is probably the thing that you most need to do to sort of get yourself unstuck. Totally. Uh, along those lines, something I thought when you were saying that is I'll often think in terms of like, okay, taking this cold shower is going to net me like X amount of dollars. I'll, I'll just, you know, try, I'll translate it into a way that, okay, this is going to give me like the uh, mental toughness that I need for like when I'm facing this tough decision today, like it's going to be worth you know, and I'll just think of some amount of dollars. I'm like, all right, we're just going to do this. This is the process. And uh, yeah, that can be motivating sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Like we're incentive, incentive driven creatures. And so like, we're always wondering like what's in it for us. So to set some sort of tangible thing 
um, is an important part of the process. Uh, on those same lines, I, I was thinking of making a bet with one of my students, John, uh, my Tactical Tuesday co-host, um, like a process-oriented bet. That is basically like not a weight loss bet or a result-based bet, but just like um, stating the day before, this is what I aim to do tomorrow and then just doing it, right? And then like you're accountable for just following that list, whether it's cold showers, uh, you know, hitting the heavy bag for 30 minutes, uh, lifting weights, whatever it is that you feel like you need to do to make sure that like you're winning each day. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't locked down the terms or gone through with it, but like it just felt like such a good idea to getting yourself back in a good space and you know, helping you stay there over the long, the long run. Right. Like I think, uh, yeah, not so much for like a weight loss bet or things like that, but some sort of process oriented bet that gets me back in the habit of doing all the things that I value. Um, I just think would, would move the needle. Yeah. I like that idea a lot. Uh, I'm a big fan myself of, I just have a pen and a notepad that I, I keep a couple of them around the house and whenever I try to get any any anxieties that I have going through my head or whenever I'm in my head, I try to get it on paper, something I've got to get done, you know, get it down. And then you've got a list of things you know, that you can, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you got to get done and you can just do those. And then that's the process. Yeah. It's exhausting carrying around all of the things that you need to do in your head. Like there is real power in writing it out by hand and there's real power in creating targets the night before for things that you aim to do. It gives you a path. You don't just wake up wandering around like, Oh, what am I doing with my life and trying to figure it out? You know exactly what it is you're supposed to do. And it just makes you much more likely to get it done. Well said. I agree completely. Um, so Going back to this year, like like you said, I guess with every year in poker, there's never a year where it's just straight up, right? <laughs> there's always <laughs> this battle um, and these like super high highs and low lows. So yeah, I guess this game, what, what do you value in this game after all this time uh, of playing cards? Like what's the, the number one thing that you value? Um, I I'd say how it uh, how it pushes me to like be my best self, just because you can't. It's just such a sort of like poker, such a microcosm for living your life. Just all the ways that you have to like be tough and be able to bounce back, and yeah, it just you can't just sort of like half you know, put half effort into and be successful in like a career of poker nowadays. You just have to like give it your all and you need to be, you know, working hard to have life balance and and be there. <clears throat> so yeah, I just love that uh I just love the freedom that it gives me and being able to do it and how it how I'm my own boss of it and I have like a hundred percent accountability. Yeah. You you're pretty well known in the poker world for having like I don't know, rarely, I'll say rarely selling action. I don't know if you've ever sold action, but like rarely, um, just having all of yourself traveling around, being on the grind, traveling the circuit and making it work right for a long time. Um, I guess firstly, is it accurate that you've never sold, uh, action or, and also like, what are some lessons that you've learned from, you know, being, one of the most year in and year out successful tournament poker players in existence. Yeah. It's, it's not accurate that I've never sold action. I've definitely sold some for uh, bigger stuff. Um, and like I said, in like five and 10 Ks, I like to swap, you know, that takes a little, a little bit of the uh, pressure off. Yeah. Um, it should be said that I've, I feel that I've been quite stressed <laughs> along this, this 15 year journey. Like a lot of a lot of people, like I think I would be a lot less stressed if I was just backed, but I'm not sure that it, I would sort of be where I am personally, and like like the mental toughness that I built, I guess if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um. So, sorry. What was the second part of the question? I can't remember. Okay. I don't remember my own. <laughs> I don't remember my own questions. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. About. Uh, 
yeah, just battling back and stuff through it. Yeah, the the stress of it is is the hard part for me. Um, just like I don't know, I, I always feel like pressure to like I try to be as present as possible at the table, and I feel like I put a lot of pressure on myself to to make the best decision each time so like i can do quite a little quite a bit of uh, beating myself up i wish that's the one thing that i wish i could get through um maybe i'll uh do you <laughs> really to... wish you could get through it shannon <laughs> like let's let's be real here uh yeah may, maybe not maybe it's for the better but yeah it's just uh it's awesome it's definitely very hard at times but uh i don't think uh i'd choose another path this has been really awesome What what's like a a failure point that you've seen other folks who endeavor to do what you've done for so long. Like I'm sure that there are lots of people that you see for a few years and then you just kind of don't see them anymore. I think a lot of people, the lifestyle just eats them up. I mean, there's so many ways to leak yourself out of this industry, whether it's, you know, drugs or alcohol or strip clubs or, you know what I mean? Just hanging around the, the wrong pits. crowds. Yeah. The pits. So it's uh, it's just very tough to like try to like you need, in my opinion, to be working really hard to finding some life balance and like building, you know, personal connections and stuff. That's something I've, you know, struggled with at times when you're running bad and you're very often running bad in tournament poker. It's hard to like open yourself up to other individuals and be vulnerable. And uh, it's yeah, ironic, I, huh? Yeah, crazy, right? It, it, it's ironic that in a profession where almost everyone feels like they're running bad all the time, <laughs> uh, the time when, you know, like all, everyone can be vulnerable. We kind of choose to not be, we choose to like isolate ourselves. Um, I just think that's, that's interesting that there's this opportunity for folks to kind of like engage and connect with this shared vulnerability. And we kind of like go into a shell. Yes. And that, it seems like a, I don't think that's specific to poker from what I've observed uh, in people in life. It's like when people are, when we're experiencing pain, we just don't want to, you know what I mean? Yeah. We don't want to like open up and, and share that with others. We just want to, you know, climb in a hole. Uh, unfortunately in poker, it happens probably more often than most professions, I would think. Yeah. So that's, that's another reason, like I think swapping is good and and people like being in, like yourself being involved in stables or being either a backy or backer that can be good for uh people the reality is for me like as i get older you know i'm 36 i have a family now it's like you're less sort of involved in friend friend groups mm -hmm. i mean i mean especially with the pandemic and shit like everybody's just the new connecting is just like messaging on whatsapp <laughs> and so uh you know, you kind of see people when you do and have some meals here and there for like uh, social su sustainability, but it's not like when you're 23 and all just hanging out, you know, doing everything together. Yeah. There's different phases in life, you know, just like when, when you're in your twenties, like your friends are kind of your family. Um, and then, you know, you get married, you have kids, you life changes and that becomes like your sole focus. And yeah, friends kind of, it, it just life changes, un unfortunately. Which, you know, I, I think this past year, a uh, year and a half of growing my community and stuff has been really big for me in that regards of developing relationships with especially guys who are like young and hungry like me, where it's like you see yourself in them. It's actually given me like a lot of juice um, that, you know, I, I didn't realize I was missing just like people that are, you know, you know, like John, again, my, my tactical Tuesday co-host, right. He just wants to see what he can do. He wants to see how big he can play. He wants to see how good he can get. He's hungry. He's motivated. He has, you know, he's tough as nails mentally. Um, just all, all the things that remind you of a, a spot that you were one time in your career that are like, wow, like this is actually kind of inspiring. Um, surrounding yourself by that. It, it's just, it's reinvigorating in a way that I, I guess I can't fully express verbally. Yeah, I know what you mean. I enjoy trying to like hang around the uh, pe people that are a bit younger at times. I think it's good, uh, good for the soul to see that, uh, you know, cause you get older and like things are like less novel, right. As you, <laughs> as you get older, you just experience new things like less and less. 
Mm-hmm. So I think we, we all, I think, naturally become a bit jaded, but I, I enjoy being around the energy of people in their like, you know, mid twenties and Absolutely. You can, get, you can get exposure to that in Las Vegas sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you, you can get a lot of exposure to that in Vegas a lot of the time. Um, what would you say to your younger, younger self um, coming up, going through this journey? Like what piece of wisdom would you share with, you know, a Shannon Shore that's 22 years old, 21 years old? I'd have to say just to try to enjoy the journey a bit more um, and not, not stress so much. Uh, it's, it's hard when you're in it. Like I, I was living a very fast paced lifestyle in my twenties, like traveling everywhere, playing all the tournaments and stuff. So I was just like super stressed and uh, all the time, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's probably the main thing. And that's, like I said, something I'm still working towards is just like not, not hanging on to the, you know, how I'm doing financially in poker so much. Yeah. Best of luck. It's <laughs> <laughs> very, very hard. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's exceptionally difficult. And, and, but it's also a thing that I think drives high performance. I think maybe we, we have that fear sort of in our brain that if we don't allow ourselves to be stressed, we'll lose our edge. We'll lose the thing that makes us want to optimize every single decision that we make at the poker table. Um, I, at least, you know, I could be projecting that's a fear that I have where it's like you, if I, I eliminate the stress, maybe it's not so important to me anymore that I'm on top of my game. Maybe it's not so important that every decision I make, um, I can be proud of. Yeah, I agree with that. And then, I mean, if you're studying the game in a way that, <clears throat> where you're trying to, uh, you know, get better, it's hard to then just show up and just not care, right? Like, Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of that, how, how are you training these days? What does your study regimen look like? Um, it's been like this last, I've been working really hard through the pandemic, uh, solving a bunch and uh, you know, watching a bunch of videos, talking with some friends, just overall being involved and bouncing hands and trying to get better. So last six months or so has been a bit busy with the kid coming and the world series of poker. I've just been playing a lot, but I still run <clears throat> quite a bit of solves myself on Pio. Just basically I, I troubleshoot spots. A lot of times I'm playing a hand live or online. I'll, I'll note, note it. Um, what, what does your notation system look like? I have, I use the note pad in my phone. Yeah. But like the, the process of like identifying a specific spot to troubleshoot. Got you. I'll I'll just note the uh, positions of the hand, the stack depths, um, and of course the cards uh, on the board, and then just run the spot later. And hopefully, I try to dig into the sim a little bit uh, and try to try to look at the other hands and stuff just to have a a better feeling. But then, like at the same time, I'm always you know wrestling with like trying, especially playing live poker. Some of the people I play against, I'm obviously trying to play exploit, exploitably. <laughs> Exploitatively. Exploitatively. It's a, yeah, that's a hard word. <laughs> a tough word. Um, so yeah, it's like, there's always, there's always that balance of like trying not to become too, there's definitely been times like recently, if I'm like studying a bunch where I feel like I'm, you know, thinking too GTO and I'll just miss, miss on spots. So yeah, I've tried to, uh, trying to be as relaxed at the table and sort of just use my knowledge of what I've learned from a GTO standpoint, but also try to just like be there and realize that we're not living in a sim, you know, where this is a, a real well, human sitting across from me that has yeah. different emotions and might be doing something crazy for no reason. Yeah. We're, we're not aware of whether or not we're living in a sim at least. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The, you know, the curse of knowledge is, is a real thing. You know, like when you know something, you can't unknow it. And then we kind of project that onto other people. Um, and it's, it, it can be a very subtle and very tricky to oscillate between, um, you know, deploying a more balanced GTO driven strategy versus a higher level opponent and then switching gears and deploying a more exploitative uh, strategy against a specific villain. And actually like you can deploy exploitative strategies against high level opponents too in 
specific situations that may be understudied um, or whatever. But like just figuring out when it's okay to pull the trigger there um, can be just quite tricky. Totally. Yeah. And then like you said about uh, projecting, it's like, I can't tell you how many times I've like the summer at the world series, I've like looked at a guy and I was just like, okay, there's no way this guy would is ever bluffing this spot. And then he just like tables, tables a bluff. I'm like, wow, I had no idea that guy had it in him. People are just really hard to predict. Too. That's yeah. what I love. I love about live poker, just trying to figure people out and like what, what drives them. It's like the most fascinating form of poker for me. Yeah. Like when you, when you analyze data, like as much as I have in this past year and a half, which has really been the primary, my primary study tool, um, you learn like these kind of thoughts that we have of like, yeah, they're never bluffing here, right? Like I've yet to see a spot where they're never bluffing. Like there's <laughs> always some kind of air ball in their range. Um, and that's just like, yeah, it's really hard to come to terms with like being a long time pro and just being like, yeah, guys just, there's never bluffing here. And then like you look at the data and you're like, oh wow, they are bluffing. And actually like, this is probably a call. Um, <laughs> holy shit. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, humans are unpredictable and they're, they just will do things for seemingly arbitrary reasons. And like, that's like a, a lot of the art form of playing live poker is sort of, trying to get a good handle on is this the time that this villain is going to just be erratic for one reason or another? Yeah, totally. I should, I should also say, and I'm sure it's something you've experienced is like <laughs> when you're getting river decisions, right or wrong. Like if you get like five in a row wrong, like that can be the most devastating. <laughs> like when you're trying to, yeah, just, often these close spots will be very close right on the river. And like, if, if you just happen to like choose wrong, like five times in a row, that's when I'll feel like I'm just totally, I have no clue how to play poker basically. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I think you have a, you have a lower tolerance for being wrong than I do in the, in the games I play in like the cash game streets. Cause like, I'm just like, so obsessed i guess with like the pot odds model like it's just like my river call efficiency has like gone down every year that i play poker it's like just goes down and gets like closer to one um where it's like you know okay i'm getting four to one like let's let's roll like uh, <laughs> uh i exp I'm, and you know i i lose a lot like you lose like and it never fe it doesn't feel great just calling and losing like on the river over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, I did a, during poker power hour, which is um, like a, a weekly, weekly group coaching thing in greatness village for folks that have bought um, some of the, the products. Um, I opened up hand to note and looked at like six river spots where villains called on the, or like where somebody called on the river with like low pair, right. In these pots. And basically showed them like they lost here, they lost here, they lost here. Right. And then they win the last one. And like, what do y'all think the result of this is? And, and like the result is they made money, <laughs> right? Like the result is like by calling every time they made money, but it just feels really bad losing, <laughs> losing, losing, winning. Um, and in tournaments where, you know, you're, life is on the line you can't just reload it's got to feel way worse i would assume yeah that was, was what i was about to say next is that yeah particularly that it's in tournaments and live is yeah <laughs> when you're looking at this guy and like man i just think this guy has it every time and then you pay him and he just does <laughs> it could it can be a bit demoralizing but yeah like you said it's like all about the the win rate of the decision yeah um it's I think this is like, it's a good conversation to have too for folks who are listening that, you know, you play poker at an exceptionally high level and you've had success for a long time, right? Now, there are folks that are playing at a lower level that haven't had that success. Like, and their experience in this world, I mean, like I just imagine sometimes, you know, like when I think about win rates, I, I'm like, you know, 
a losing player can run bad <laughs> too. Like a losing player can get their aces cracked over and over and over and over again. And like that experience has to be so much more devastating than winning players. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. I mean, you see it so much in tournaments, people bemoaning their luck and stuff and <laughs> talking about how they hate jacks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, when you're, if you're deep and if you've never had a big score and then you're down to the final 27 and you just lose like ace king versus ace queen and you just knew it was going to happen, like, yeah, it's going to, you have like such a recency bias. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the reality is you have to win so many hands to be deep in a, like a tournament, you know, that like, very often you're just not going to win like all five of your all ins, right? All five yeah. of your key all in. And you shouldn't, right? Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you like you, you should lose some of those. I mean, that's just the reality of numbers, you know? And I, I think that like, how many times have you been deep in a tournament and just like, you're just done, you know, in 24th place or whatever, <laughs> where you play a pot for the chip lead, you know, it's like probably can't even count the number of times that's happened. Exactly. Yeah. And then the key is battling the entitlement that we all, I think, experience at some point that we should be the one to, to win when the reality yeah. is there's no rules for who gets to win. Yeah. There, there's no rule. You know, it's just whatever happens, happens. Um, the only, we, we could try to control the controllables, right? That's all that you can do and just put on a brave face and pay more money to the WSOP, <laughs> 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 buy into the next tournament. Exactly. Survived preflop boot camp. You've shot the fish in a barrel. Now, prepare yourself for the feeding frenzy. A comprehensive strategy for gutting every fish in your player pool. Data driven hero bluffs, light call downs, and perfect value bets that are maximally designed to hurt some feelings. Feeding Frenzy. Available now at chasingpokergreatness.com slash feeding frenzy. I'm actually a little curious. Like for the live, the live grinder, right? So your cash is this year like 1.1 million. Like, what's the lifestyle of playing tournaments all year round? Like, what are the ex what does the expense look like? Uh, it's a it's a bit different for me now than it was in the past because in the past it involved a lot more traveling mm -hmm. um this year i was able to get like quite a bit of volume in in las vegas i think i've only made a couple trips to florida i think that's the only places i've played other than vegas this year i also am like from the years of i spent so much time traveling i uh consider myself like pretty expert as far as managing travel expenses and stuff as far as like knowing, you know, what, what flights to book, booking them at the right times and stuff like that. So I'm able to, you know, manage that, of course, is part of your bottom line, right? So I, I try as best I can to save money that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's just, I try to keep enough cash on hand to uh, handle the swings because you don't want to not have enough cash. You know, I, I don't like playing. I'm sure we've all experienced playing on like low bankrolls sort of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just try to, you know, keep cash on hand and mentally I, <clears throat> before any given series, I try to sort of, I, you know, lay out the series and be, you know, prepare myself for, yeah, you might just get wrecked here for this amount of money. Yeah. And just try to like refocus myself for every series. What are like yearly expenses for, you know, when you're traveling around on the grind? Um, that's a good question. I've never really dug into it too much let's say let's say if you make like a week trip to florida i might pay like pretty good with the flights and stuff i can get flights for like 400 round trip probably and then a room might cost me like 100 to 120 bucks a night depending like sometimes i'll get a house with people and stuff so Mm -hmm. you no, know, you can make a trip for fifteen hundred bucks um and get like a ton of act you know get fifty k in buy ins or more on that so <clears throat> it's actually not like and then of course, there's other expenses involved you know you you often might be spending more money on meals and stuff yeah um but thankfully i'm 
I, I'm at a point where I'm not like having to knit it up too hard. You know, I'm trying to enjoy myself along these uh, trips a little bit more. And I feel like it helps my, you know what I mean? If I'm, a, if I'm less worried about expenses, I'm more able to relax. Yeah. And just more able to, I mean, like paying for food, like getting good nutrition matters. I mean, mm -hmm. being in a decent surrounding where you're not like terrified of getting robbed in your hotel probably matters some too. Mm -hmm. Um, how many trips like that would you say that you took in like a typical year 10 years ago? Um, man, yeah, I was traveling a lot. I, um, had to be like two per month on average, I would say. Like 24 a year. Yeah. 24 a year, 1500 a trip. What's the math say, Shannon? Help, 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 a, help a brother with the math. <laughs> that's 36 dimes. Something to, tells me that I spent <clears throat> probably more than that per year, though, in my prime of traveling. Because mm -hmm. I, I was also, <clears throat> I was also traveling internationally. Yeah. Uh, so, so there were some more expenses involved. Yeah. So probably but, like 40 <clears throat> to 50, 40 to 50 K just, just in travel expenses that you've got to outrun every year. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what would you say to, to somebody that's like trying to make it like that has ambitions of making it doing the same thing that, you know, you did back in your back, back in the old days. Um, I would, I honestly can't say that I'd recommend it. And, you know, I get some messages from people, uh, ask, you know, asking that question and it's, I don't know, poker is just like, I, I feel like at my timing, like the way it worked out is I just got into poker at like, the nut time you know with it blowing up and stuff um it's definitely a much tougher uh business nowadays that isn't to say it's not uh attainable i'm not like too in touch with the cash game scene or like how someone would get uh get themselves off the ground at this point um but i would say it's not all a, it's not all like the glamour that <clears throat> it's portrayed to be <laughs> uh on social media and stuff because there's a lot of pain <laughs> yeah involved and what percent would you say is glamour <laughs> <laughs> um well i just came third in a tournament so right now i'm feeling pretty good but, <laughs> 40 percent um, glamour but a month ago it was like 0.1 yeah. percent glamour a month ago it's like what am i doing with my life <laughs> i've got a kid on the way and, <laughs> and i have no idea what to do on the river versus this guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a very, very tough, uh, way to make a living. It's like, if, if it's something where you really want to test yourself and like take a shot and have complete accountability and freedom, it, it's an awesome thing to, to go for. Yeah. But it's going to test you and yeah. be sure that you love the game and you love the competition. You love the struggle because it's not something you do for money only money will will not it's not enough of a driver to allow you to make it in this world mm -hmm. yeah they're gonna experience all sorts of emotions uh just like you know you one thing i really love about poker is just meeting people from all walks of life uh just uh you know it exposes you to so many different types of people and particularly playing live you get to see all these emotions play out like you just get a like a real life education by seeing just every different emotion play out in a, in a wide variety of people. Um, so yeah, you get to, you get to experience that, but at the same time, it will like cause you a lot of people will say shit to you at the table or <laughs> beat you out of a pod and it will make you feel a certain way. Um, so it'll like be prepared to just experience a lot of different emotions. I, I personally like to sit with my emotions. I know this is something that like, probably not a lot of poker players do but um as opposed to just like immediately try to escape you know bust a tournament and try to escape with weed or alcohol which i've definitely been known to do at times as well but uh but i think it's important to like sit with how you feel and even journal if you can um and it will just it'll teach you so much about yourself because it's just such a it's such a great like learning tool tell me a learning tool yeah, what does that look like sitting with your emotions for you? Um, just like chilling on the couch for me with a notepad and just like trying to breathe and uh, like feel feel what I'm feeling and try to turn inward. 
as opposed to just like distracting myself with the show or you know, whatever else. What's the downside of distracting yourself with the show? Um, just that you, you will never like, you, you won't learn to deal. Like say you, say you have a leak where you just uh, keep paying off uh, every river regardless. Um, if you don't like trying to understand why you might be doing that, like if you if you never spend any time trying to understand why that's the case, then you're just gonna keep doing it, right? Yeah. So I think it's important important to like think, like in particular, in particular, I was felt there was a period a couple of years ago where I felt like I was a like just big calling station. I just kept paying people off, and I was like, why am I? <laughs> why am I doing this? I, I just like, there's something about like, I guess being bluffed or something that can, it feels like very personal uh, mm-hmm. and like feels like you're being slighted. So like, I think I identified that like that was it. And it was just, I think for me, it was like a, uh, an ego thing. Yeah. Like it, it definitely doesn't feel good to be bluffed. Like, <laughs> and I think that is a, a driving force behind lots of poker players decisions. Like when facing an all in is like, we just do not want to, you know, like you said, you know, this guy's never bluffing and then you fold and then they show the bluff. Like that's a thing that makes people feel bad. Um, it, it does, <laughs> does not feel good. Uh, I think another, another thing in poker too, is like if you're playing a tournament, um, and you run up a stack and then you get whacked for a lot of your stack, just sort of giving it away, right? Just sort of like trying to get back to where you were at instantly or very, very quickly. That leads to some like downstream bad decisions. Um, You bust out and you know, you can walk away from the table just kind of shaking your head. Um, Whereas like if you, just watch TV. You never dive into like why this happened. Why am I doing this? Like, wh- because like you're, you know, that that's a pretty major leak um, as it relates to like tournaments specifically. Um, so you need to get to the root of like why you're pressing in those spots. Why are you feeling anxious? Why are you um, just trying to trying to get back to even so that you can do better next time? Because like that's sort of the process, right? We we want to. We want to constantly be aware of what is uh, affecting us mentally, emotionally, and is leading us to play at a lower level. And then we want to resolve that on a regular basis. Yeah, and I think what leads to a lot of uh, – like we live in a very fast-paced world, right? And we all want like instant gratification. So like when one thing goes wrong, often we just you know, lose our minds a little bit. Like we think we should be winning like right now we should we should be the guy that you know poker news is talking about that is the top of the leaderboard like and everybody wants that right but there just isn't enough room for for everyone to crush so like i think just being uh having a sense of the reality of uh the business and just like accepting everything as is is like super key for poker success but it like i said it comes and goes with me like if I'm relaxed and for me like if I'm playing a long poker grind like something like the World Series of Poker like four or five weeks in it's just like you know you always tell myself I'm gonna you know work out and do this stuff you know to keep balance but at some point like the wheels inevitably just always (laughs) fall off (laughs) yeah and whether like I mean you look at the Rio like in week six or whatever of the World Series it's like everybody's miserable like whether (laughs) whether they're winning or losing like everybody's just exhausted and um yeah, I might have been rambling a little bit there. But, yeah. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> it's true. And I think that like, you know, there's a quote that says that we always overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in 10, um, alluding to we just wanting like instant fixes, instant gratification, instant solutions, instant results. Um, and yeah, it just, that's not the way that that life is. So keep grinding. And after 10 years, like you will get the results if you put in the work, like that's just the nature of it, but you have to keep putting in the work and try not to be entitled, try to learn and grow just like on a, on an everyday basis. Um, let's, uh, so imagine there's a, there's a greatest hits collection 
for the best stories you've accumulated. And I, I'm assuming you've accumulated a fair amount of stories in your day. Like what's a story that's on your greatest hits collection? Uh, with regards to poker? Yeah. Um, I've, the thing for me, like, which always like gnaws at me a little bit is I don't have, well, I guess I do have a major title now. I won the, a poker master, which is uh, a major title. But for me, like, that's all like, that's the thing that like, um, like I've come up short on is a major title, right? I don't want a WPT or a bracelet or anything. So that's like, that's the first thing I think that I'm like lacking. But as far as like the highlights, just it has, there's been like wins in Florida and Barcelona, like winning a tournament is just like the most pure feeling, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so having won tournaments in Florida and Barcelona and Vegas and stuff, those are always like awesome feeling. Um, particularly this year, like, they were like the moments that I experienced, like this has been a, such a special year for me personally, having my daughter, like the, even this tournament yesterday coming third was just like such a magical feeling, like being motivated by my daughter to like go deep in this thing. And before her arrival, when Joy was pregnant, I won a couple tournaments and I just felt uh, super motivated. So yeah, those were just like this year has just been an all time highlight for me. I didn't realize I didn't realize your third was yesterday. <laughs> I guess two days two days ago maybe the day yeah this podcast comes at a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's pretty funny because we it's been scheduled for like a month or so, uh, <laughs> three three weeks or a month. Um, Mike Nori, who recently came on, like scheduled his and had to push his back like three times in the same week because he went deep in a WSOP event and won a bracelet like <laughs> right, <laughs> right before we were supposed to go on. So yeah, congratulations, man. We get given the CPG run good a little bit. Um, there we go. So who was who your biggest influence in becoming a poker pro? Uh, I'd have to say John Little was uh, a huge influence for me when I first got started. He was a mentor of mine, like, first were playing online back in 2005 or whatever it was <clears throat> um yeah so coming up with him and I like I came up with guys like Durr and Robel and Phil Galfon like those were some of the guys at the top uh at the time when I got into it so particularly I say I was influenced by guys just my age and my generation more so than like the older generation just because it was I was just so fascinated by it that there are like people sort of my age doing the same thing yeah. How, how is Mr. Jonathan Little so influential? Like, what does that like look like internally? He was uh, probably a year or so ahead of me in terms of uh, playing online uh, at the levels that we eventually started playing together. And he, we just started talk, talk, talking on AOL Instant Messenger. Oh, and man. he, <laughs> he, like gave me a bunch of uh, good advice for these sit and goes we were playing. And then we just have become uh, lifelong friends since. Yeah. So not exactly shocking that he runs poker coaching, right? Like it it's, takes um, a specific person to discuss strategy with people they're actively playing against on a regular basis, right? Like I think that that just shows sort of kind of who he is innately. Um, as it relates to sharing knowledge and yeah, just being, uh, in my opinion, somebody that that's kind of a giver, um, that it does not have like a scarcity mindset. Yes. Well said. What would you say is your poker superpower? Poker superpower. I'm going to say it's just my, I've got to say my mental toughness and my ability to like reset for each session and like show up with like a pretty good version of myself. I think a lot of people just don't do that. They're just got sort of like going through the motions, but I really try to, before each poker session, I really try to reset, uh, try to do something good for myself, whether it's even like a 10 minute yoga routine or meditation, try to eat a healthy breakfast. Like I really try to be ready to put, like play long days of poker uh, before I arrive. Yeah, and even with all that, like the grind of something like the WSOP, just like, is there anybody out there that just is just like fresh as just fresh as a, what's the expression? Fresh as a daisy? Is that a thing? Oh, uh, yeah. At, at, like, at like the end after the grind? Probably not. 
So this is a pretty uh, involved, exhausting uh, gig we take part in, isn't it? It is. Uh, the tournament world, I can't even really imagine just like, I like a normal sleep schedule. I like my day structured and routine, um, like the times that I eat, like just everything like kind of systematic and tournament poker is holy shit, like not <laughs> systematic. <laughs> um, just like the adrenaline you feel, the energy at late hours in the morning, going to bed at a crazy time, um, you know, waking up at a little later in the day when the sun's been up for quite a few hours and then going back and doing it again. Like, it's just really, really, really hard. I have so much respect for you guys that can, I mean, they, they, they can just do it physically because like, I, I don't think I could. Yes. It is very, uh, I try to like, like this, this year, I try to like do some more late registering, uh, just to like, so I can at least get up and like go for a walk with joy or something and try to like have some balance and sustainability, but it's definitely still after six weeks of doing it, it's very, uh, very tough. <laughs> yeah. What would you say is the value of doing that one thing before each tournament you play? If you could, uh, if you could measure it monetarily. I would say it just keeps me from, Oh, it, in terms of, yeah, I mean, it must be worth like, a couple percent of uh, your buy-in, I would say. But I also think it just, just being out in the world and seeing people and, you know, hearing, you know, little kids' voices and being in nature, it's like it, it, remind, it keeps me from tunneling. Like when, if I'm playing a grind and I'm like not doing anything else, I'm just like only focused on the poker. And it's just like when it's going bad, which it very often is in tournaments, you're just like, you're miserable, right? So it's, like I think have get reminding yourself that there's an outside world where yeah. like people are happy and, you know, having interaction with a cashier where you like smile and say, thank you. Just like, uh, yeah, it gives you some sustainability during a long grind. Yeah. And I mean, we're human beings, right? We're living our lives We're this is our life experience. And so there's immense value in despite things going poorly in the poker world, compartmentalizing and realizing that like, oh, there's like joyful things to experience, even when things are not going well, right? Like nature is still there. We can go out, get a fresh breath of air, talk to people, smile, like you said, um, just find some tranquility and peace, um, and then kind of go back to the grind. But we want to have a good life experience first and foremost. And when you're, when you just have tunnel vision, it's just really easy to, it's really easy to get more cynical and to get more burnt out and to just have yeah, really bad thoughts about what you do for a living. Yes. Um, all right. So when you think of a nemesis in your poker career, and this doesn't actually have to be like a person, it could be some outside force. Um, what comes to your mind? Um, I think last time I was on your show, I discussed uh, how pornography had been such a <clears throat> negative effect on my life and the way that it controlled my attention. Mm -hmm. um, I've since gotten through that, which feels awesome. Um, I realized how much I, just like any addiction, when you, I used it, like I turned to it for like the pain that I was experiencing in poker um, and like, the often loneliness uh, that was involved. I turned to like, sex and porn that's like all that was my like hit of dopamine um but yeah not not needing that uh anymore and just like having like better control of my attention and being able to relax and just like accept things for the way they are it's uh yeah, it's been quite a freeing experience tell me about your like your daily routine it, it sounds a lot like meditation journaling um, what tactics do you deploy on a regular basis outside of those two? Um, I, I usually wake up and ha and do like, probably like a 20 minute stretching and yoga routine just to get like, uh, my blood flowing through my entire body. I have water first thing. This is all before looking at my, uh, before looking at my phone, I have water and, uh, yeah, just try to get kind of woken up, I'll step outside my backyard, get some light, 
And then like, yeah, I immediately sort of start to feel better. I'll shower and generally joy <clears throat> makes me breakfast of like eggs and greens. And yeah, then I just feel like super ready to, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm much more relaxed. Obviously in the morning after a long grind, it like, it takes a minute to get going, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, after that, like whatever hour, hour and a half period of time that is, you know, it's super helpful to have a partner who like, you know, makes me food while like I can you know, do my stuff. Yeah. Get ready. And yeah, then I, I feel generally uh, ready. And I, uh, I don't always, you know, get not meditation isn't necessarily a daily thing when I have like more time off, but I, I try to make it a daily thing. But, like these things come, come and go. I don't think you have to have like a rigid, like, okay, I got to do this, this, this. I've definitely had times in my life where I tried to like pile too much of this goodness into, <laughs> into one thing. And then it just like all falls off the rails. Cause like I miss one thing. So yep. I try not to be too hard on myself about like, all right, you got to, work out four times a week I try to just like be in touch with myself and the flow of like where I am and what I need and have like I have a list of tools I also like flotation tanks uh Thai massages those type things I think if you can mix that type stuff in uh as opposed to you know oh I'm gonna go eat eat a burger and chill and watch this you know comedy that I've seen four times mm -hmm. uh, it's probably I try to just insert as much goodness as I can when I can, I guess. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, insert goodness, as much goodness as you can. Um, I think, uh, there's another quote too, like when you win, win the morning, you win the day. Right. And I think that's exceptionally important. Um, in this industry is like just trying to win the morning, whatever that looks like for you specifically, I've got a morning routine that I go through on a daily basis. Um, I wake up, uh, I lay in bed actually for like 30 minutes or so while my brain is kind of getting on foggy, just lay with my wife. Um, and then I drink some athletic greens, um, sort of first thing. Then I have like a, an app bend on my phone. I stretch for like 15 minutes, um, do some breath work, uh, another app on my phone to kind of get me ready to go. And then, you know, then it's like, look at my computer, look at my phone, like attack my agenda, look at my journal to see like what I've written in there, uh, for things to do the next day. But yeah, that routine, um, it's just, it's night and day when I do it. And when I don't, when I don't, I'm miserable. And when I do, I feel great. Um, and you know, it's just, the value is just, just immense. Totally identify with that. Uh, uh what should also be said is, uh, winning the evening can be really important too, in terms of like, I'll often uh, just like try to drink chamomile tea and shut, stop screen, uh, not be watching screen right up until bed. Yeah. Um, it's also, I think, really important for sleep is obviously worth so much. Sleep is one of the most valuable things we do and should be a number one priority just in optimizing life experience. Um, just getting how much sleep you need. That's the thing that like they say eight hours, but it's not exactly eight hours. It's human dependent some people need less some people need more i need about nine hours and like if i don't get it i'm like trash and like so you have to prioritize it if i have goals if i have things i want to do then like sleep is most important um all right so let, let's do some like lightning round questions and we'll get you out of here you can go go spend some more time with your the little shore in your world um, mm -hmm. when you think of pots one in your poker career, what's the first hand that comes to mind? First one that just popped in my head had to be in 2006 winning the Bellagio cup, which really like got me, uh, got me on my journey. Um, I just picked up aces heads up for Danny Wong, for the 2006 Bellagio cup and, and I won the pot with that hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. What was what was the win? That was for it was a million dollars posted, but I think I took about five seventy five when it was all said and done. Isn't that a major title? That feels like a major title. It feels it felt pretty major at the time. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feels like a major one. Um, the opposite question: When you think of pots lost, what's the first hand that comes to mind? 
Uh, all right, I got to go with the one, just the one that I experienced uh, two nights ago at the win. I played a uh, small blind shove. It was we we're three handed, the small blind shove, 16 bigs. I had ace eight off call. He has king 10 off. And right before this board is run out, I'm like, wow, this is, so we hadn't like made any deals three handed or anything. And I'm like, wow, this pot is for so much equity. <laughs> um, and then the window was just a king. And it came King King X, Ugh. and I was just dead basically. Yeah. Sorry for the bad beat story. Well, I did ask a question. You get what you ask for with that question. <laughs> um, have you made any purchases in the last year that have been impactful to your poker game? Um, yeah, I'd say like, I, well, I bought a house in in May, and uh, we've been spending a lot of time just, you know, customizing it. I bought a pool table and I've uh, I invested in like some dark out shades to go on the outside of the house that, you know, I mean, I, I like to spend money in that way, like investing it. So it gives me like more happiness and like the ability to like long-term, like go with this business sort of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely uh, some stuff like that around the house. And I've got my sort of office set up the way I like it. So. That's, that's kind of the fun stuff that I've been spending money on lately. Yeah. Uh, blackout shades. I, we have them as well. Um, very important. <laughs> Again, <laughs> anything you can do to like upgrade your sleep and make sure that your sleep is more restful. You know, you mentioned not having your phone in your bedroom. Um, what is your process for not taking your phone into the bedroom each night? I just leave it on a charger in the living room. That way I have no, no chance of getting it. And it's quite amazing how much uh, relaxation that, you know, allows you versus if it's there and you hear a ping or feel a vibration in the middle of the night or something like that. Or yes. even just waking up. If you feel like you've got to wake up and your phone's right there. And even if you have to like pick it up and carry it out of your bedroom, it's like you're probably going to flick on the screen, right? And see if you have any messages and then your brain's going to be scattered. And Yeah, it's, it, it's built that way to grab our attention. So like if it's in your room, you wake up at 4 a.m., even just going, what time is it? And like looking at your phone and then <laughs> all of a sudden you see just emails or messages or whatever it is. And all of a sudden you're like wide awake at 4 a.m. and struggling to go back to sleep. Um, what's, what's something that hasn't worked for you? You know, you mentioned like yoga, meditation, the flotation, tanks, um, what's, what's something you've tried that was just like, nah. Um, I, I, was, I was trying, <laughs> I've been trying to play some more golf to like, uh, I'm trying to ease into like a general, general, like more relaxed human. <laughs> and, uh, I fucking suck at golf. It's such a hard <laughs> game. <laughs> Most athletic stuff that I've like taken part of, you know, I've been, like, I feel like I've naturally been pretty decent, <laughs> but, uh, golf's been a frustrating one for me. So I'm going to, that's, that's a goal of mine that, that I'm going to work on. Doesn't sound like that's a very relaxing experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem. It's not for the relaxing. It's more tilting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the you know competitor in you that wants to <laughs> do well. Um, why why get involved with golf? Because I mean, it's something that like I've thought about because I've never been a golfer, but lots of people do it and lots of people love it. But I'm terrified because as I mentioned before, I'm kind of an obsessive human being and I'm really scared of going down that rabbit hole. Yes. It's very, uh, if we thought poker was involved, uh, golfers might have something different to say, might, <laughs> might say that golf's even more so. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I love it. Like when, when you do hit good shots, it feels so good. And just being outside and like, there's so many poker players, friends of mine out here that play golf. So it's like an awesome thing to do socially and just be outside. Yeah. <clears throat> So I, I, I kind of want to get at least somewhat decent at it. So I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep getting out there a little bit. Keep plugging away. Yeah. Um, what are some things in your poker career you wish you said no to more often? Um, probably, probably just, I, I said no for the early parts of my career. I said no to like studying, uh, or like putting in any hard work. I just like instead wanted to like, party and travel and be out and stuff but even then i'm not sure i like regret that you know i think it was so formative like 
I'm, like I don't, I can't say I have many regrets because all, all those experiences were so, so formative in me, like becoming who I am. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, there were times earlier in my career where I could have worked harder and stuff, but everything's led to this awesome moment on this podcast with you. So here we are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> A- anything you wish you had said yes to more often? Um, I'd say probably like even more becoming even more involved in the poker community in my younger years. Like I often like kept to myself. Um, I always, I just think saying yes to like things in life in general is a really good idea just to expose yourself to all sorts of people and social experiences and stuff. And I, I didn't, I wasn't always the best at that, but I've gotten pretty good at it. I think. How come you didn't say yes earlier in your career? You were more of the lone wolf. Yeah. I think I was probably just experiencing too much pain from like, I wasn't ready for like the pain that poker brings you. (laughs) Like when you, when you start swinging down. Yeah. just very often uh, uh, just miserable from yeah. Boston tournaments. Trying to survive. <laughs> just yeah. trying, trying to make it through until the next day you get to buy in again and get another shot. Yeah. Um, have you ever strongly believed something about poker only to change your mind later on? And if so, what led to that change? Um, I, I'd say just, yeah, there's, I'd say in general, there's been just so many spots where I was just certain that I was like playing them correctly. And I guess that's the same for everybody until you're exposed to like, that you might be like blundering a spot, you know, you just get fixed, just play the spot the same way uh, without ever even thinking that it can be played a different way. Uh, how, how do you go through that process of like discovery and then humility because it does take humility to realize that you've been blundering a spot for quite a while. Um, and then, you know, exploring, exploring that and then integrating it into your game. Yeah. I think, uh, solvers have helped a lot for that with me. It's just like, you know, you can take any spot basically from any positions and, you know, analyze it on, you know, a range of different or you know, a number of different boards. Uh, you know, see see how to play it. So that's that's been huge for me. Also, just you know, talking to people and being more early on in my career, I was also quite. Uh, you see it a lot. Like I I see it a lot in younger uh, players as well. You're just like super arrogant about your game, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you just uh, like th- think you know everything. So I was like reluctant to like ask for help or like talk talk many hands for people for a number of years. Yeah. It's- um, I think that's the curse of youth or maybe the blessing of youth because like without that arrogance, it quite frankly, you know, you, you said earlier that like you wouldn't, you don't even know if people should pursue poker. Right. But, but it's only through that like arrogant belief in yourself that is probably misguided. It's like the fuel to pursue poker at a high level. It kind of takes that not knowing and just assuming it's going to be okay to make it through. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well said. <clears throat> yeah it's kind of like the necessary yeah, ingredient it is a- as i get older too like the more that i learn about poker the more i realize i don't know it's like you know it, like the uh, amount of things i don't know in poker feels like limitless <laughs> Like there's just so much that I don't know. Um, as somebody that's been playing the game for like 16 years, you know, however long now, seven, whatever, um, a while, my whole adult life, it's like kind of crazy how much I feel like I still don't know. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's an interesting little, little thing about, about youth. And a lot of times though, that ignorance can bring about some measures of success, just the audacious ignorance, um, that, uh, yeah, that young people have the hunger too, because they're trying to make it and they're trying to like build their name, build up who they are, prove something. And then like, when you get in your later stages of your career, mid stages of your career, that's not as important anymore. So I I think that's another thing that, that the youth, uh, have going for them. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you worked on any projects that are near and dear to your heart? I uh, haven't haven't been too much 
lately there's been so much going on with uh, my family moving into this house and getting prepared for this baby. So I guess that's a project. I, that's a project, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just sort of uh, getting our place optimized for her arrival and uh, just uh, reading to her and singing lullabies to her. You know, just tr- my main project right now is to give her the best, uh, you know, upbringing and a nice calm upbringing and try to teach her as much as possible and see how it goes. Yeah. Savor, savor these moments because like everything in life, you know, it's, they're temporary. Um, they get older much, much more quickly than you can imagine. And just like all, all this time is just, yeah, just savor it. We're, we're always changing, always growing. Um, and uh, speaking as someone that has uh, two daughters now that are 13 and 11, like it's just kind of, uh, it boggles my mind to think that so much time has passed already. <laughs> Life happens fast. It does. It does. Uh, uh, they say the, um, the days are long, but the years are short. And that's certainly true in my experience. Mm. Uh, so if final question, if the Chasing Poker Greatness audience wants to learn more about you on the World Wide Web, where do they go? Uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter or Instagram, Shannon Shore. Post some stuff there occasionally. I'm not huge into social media, but I like to mess around every once in a while. Yeah, show up at the on the tournament scene in Vegas. You'll be sure to see Shannon. <laughs> we'll see, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. It's been great having you on. We waited too long to do this. Um, always a pleasure. Always a joy. Very grateful for you. Thank you for your time, man. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast. 